My name is Nicole Chong. I'm a curator at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. This book was published in 2019 by the Hong Kong University Press. In this book, I challenge the assumed popular identity of the so-called Tianlong Imperial Art Collection and reconsider what constitutes the actual collection, leading into a reevaluation of the collection's historiography, function, significance, and implication. The Qianlong Emperor, who was on the throne from 1735 to 1796, is known for amassing the numerous store of cultural riches that has shaped our understanding of Chinese art history. Yet, in spite of the abundant existing studies, a fundamental issue remains obscure. What was the collection, and how personalized was it? In the first chapter, I examined the phrase imperial art collection through philological and textual studies. The concept of fine art was actually introduced to China from Europe through Japan in the 19th century and did not exist at the Qing imperial court in the 18th century. The collection may or may not contain those objects that are often described as works of art today. I also demonstrate that objects acquired from different sources were paid for and managed by different administrative units. Only objects managed by the imperial household department should be seen as part of the emperor's personal possession. Objects commissioned for the outer court, such as this jar, should be excluded from the discussion. And although large numbers of objects flooded into the emperor's vault, only some were actively selected and assembled to form a collection, and they were segregated from the rest of imperial holdings. In addition, the term collection in Chinese, Cang, implies a certain degree of importance and a sense of secrecy, nuances that are lost in translation. True collectibles were boxed up and hidden from view most of the time. The actual collection therefore contains a much more restricted group of objects. In the beginning of the 20th century, to reduce the disgrace of and to lessen public anger towards the sales of palace holdings, the Qing imperial household tactically obscured the line between collectibles and non-collectibles. The nationalist government also blurred the line by treating all objects accumulated at the Forbidden City as national treasures, which gave rise to the persistent myth of a monumental collection. In the second chapter, I examined the formation of the collection and the possession aspects of selection, which consists of various activities normally associated with the practice of connoisseurship. Due to the reliance upon expert knowledge, emperors before Qianlong were not usually engaged with objects personally. In fact, they could be the last ones to see a certain work after it had been researched and selected by the experts. By and large, the practice of connoisseurship was also performed collectively by an array of specialists at the Qianlong court. They were the ones who assessed materials and techniques and identified the objects. Contrary to common belief, most of the time, it was also these specialists who inscribed and stamped seals on objects. They were responsible for compiling different forms of catalogs. Evidence shows that the act of compiling the catalogs is not to record, but to create a collection. Collectibles are selected from a range of items, assembled to create meaningful series, and carefully hidden away. The specialists were also responsible for ranking palace holdings, labeling objects, and storing them. Rather than being personally engaged with individual objects, the emperor assumed the role of overseeing the project of managing palace holdings. The creation of the collection was an institutional effort rather than a personal activity. The third chapter focuses on commissioned works patronized by the Qianlong Emperor and examines the relationship between objects made by the imperial workshops and the collection of the imperial household. My research reveals that among the numerous objects commissioned by the Qianlong Emperor, many never enter the collection of the imperial household. On the other hand, unfinished works such as preliminary drawings, patterns, models, and prototypes that were used as guides to produce commissioned works should be seen as part of the collection of the imperial household as they fulfill the criteria of true collectibles as defined in Chapter 1. Once a collection of standardized models was established, imperial workshops could operate on their own with minimum supervision from the emperor. From a managerial point of view, these unfinished works were much more important to the emperor than many of the final products. 
The fourth and final chapter reconsiders the function of the collection. Visual perceptibility was and still is very much identified as a feature uh, and even part of the definition of a collection. It is commonly believed that visual displays of rural collections are exploited by rulers to express their superiority. I, however, suggest that in East Asia, power and superiority are often conveyed by concealment. Hidden collectibles were more esteemed by the emperor's subjects when they could be viewed only occasionally. More importantly, what the collection represented to the emperor is much more significant than its physical appearance in palaces or its materiality. I propose that the collection of the Qing imperial household is an assemblage of evidentiary objects which contain information essential to its successful rule, including knowledge that will remind the emperor the Qing Empire's new position in history and in its contemporaneous global context. The collection was hidden to ensure monopoly over vital information. In addition, the art of memory and the mnemonic system of the mandala were both known by the Qing imperial court and both involved retrieving memory by placing objects as reminders in an imaginary architecture. The fact that the Qianlong emperor organized most of his catalogs in architectural terms also support that collectibles served as reminders to recall information. Overall, the research re-establishes the definition and description of the actual collection and draws attention to objects which are not usually considered works of art or objects that fall out of the tradition of Chinese art history as potential true collectibles. This book also argues that imperial collecting was a collective and systematic endeavor rather than a leisurely activity for a single individual, challenging the common belief that the personal taste and preferences of the emperor contributed directly to the formation of the entire collection. Ultimately, it is hoped that by proposing a different framework, new light is cast on this well-established subject, and a range of fresh discussions will be stimulated to further the understanding of the political and cultural agenda of the Qing dynasty during the Qianlong reign, as well as the re-evaluation of imperial collecting in China in general. Thank you.